Good evening. Welcome to the November 7th session of the Bellingham City Council. Bellingham City Council meets all requirements of the State of Washington Open Meetings Act. On, we have one announcement. On Monday, November 14th, the Bellingham City Council will host a public hearing on the 2017-2018 biennial budget at 7 p.m. in Council Chambers. If you could please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we're going to start out our evening with a public hearing. Oh, uh, actually, maybe we'll start with a roll call and then we'll go to public hearing. <laughs> April Barker? Here. Dan Hamill? Here. Jean Knudsen? Here. Michael Lelliquist? Here. Roxanne Murphy? Here. Pinky Vargas? Here. And Terry Borneman is excused. Okay, we're going to have a public hearing tonight uh, to consider two requests to docket comprehensive plan amendments for review in 2016-2017. And I'll turn it over to Rick Seppler, our planning and community director. Yes, good evening, members of the council. Uh, tonight, we come before you with the Planning Commission recommendation for docketing for comprehensive plan amendment. As council will recall, docketing does not assure approval or denial of an application, but that the application to amend the comprehensive plan meets a certain set of criteria established in the municipal code. Uh, tonight, we present the recommendation which asks that two items be docketed. And I'll turn the specifics of the request over to Planner Moshe Quinn. Thank you. Moshe Quinn with the Planning Division. And tonight is just going to be a short presentation because there's only two requests that we're considering. So as mentioned, we are considering two requests to be added to the annual docket for 2016-2017 review cycle. Bellingham Municipal Code contains specific criteria to place an item on the docket, which is basically a list of comprehensive plan amendments to be evaluated in the next cycle. The first criteria is that staff has the resources available to review the uh, proposal within the annual time frame. And then the application must meet one of the following proposal, one of the following criteria represents an issue addressed in the comprehensive plan or neighborhood plan, demonstrates a potential to serve the public interest by implementing goals and policies of the comprehensive plan, serves the public interest to be considered in the next docketing cycle for review and amendment addresses changes, changing circumstances, changing community values or updated information. And lastly, uh, there's been some changes in state law that requires an amendment to go through for the comprehensive plan. The first proposal before you is located in the Barclay neighborhood in area one. And currently uh, this portion of property right here is just over 11,000 square feet. And uh, the applicant wishes to rezone this area from residential single to commercial plan. And council may remember that this main portion of the property was annexed into the city in 2016. And so this zoning boundary was created actually with the consolidation of Whatcom County. And so this was the existing city limit line. So it basically just cut off that southwestern portion of the property. This map here kind of shows that area a little bit more clearly. As you can see, this is the property here that we're looking at rezoning. So when we did the annexation, we could not change the zoning through that process. They had to go through a comprehensive plan amendment. So that's what the applicant see is seeking. And with that, he will have better flexible design opportunities to develop the site. Because currently, with this area being zoned residential single, he has to maintain a 20-foot setback from that residential zone line, which pushes the building farther back. And uh, within the zoning code itself for this area, special regulations call for the building to be moved forward as close as possible to the front property line. So that kind of is a little bit of, a, of an inconsistency with that. So what the applicant would like to do is, is you know, develop their property under one single zoning designation. The second proposal is located in the Cordata neighborhood in Area 20. This area was annexed to the city in 2013, and 
the applicant wishes to rezone it from residential single to industrial plan. Now this zoning boundary does not follow a platted line. This is all one parcel. So when the city adopted comparable zoning, we had to align it with the county's uh, zoning, which had zoned that area as residential, or URMX, residential single, basically, and the other portion of it to industrial. Now, the uh, eastern portion of this property contains several wetlands and associated buffers that go along with them, as well as environmental features here. So this area is basically separated from other residential zones in the Cordata neighborhood uh, because of the environmental features, as well as this area here is the city's regional stormwater facility and conservation area. And uh, this area here is also a mitigation site area as well as this area. So it's kind of cut off from the other portion because of those, those features. And then this area here is all zoned industrial. So currently access is taken through the other property through here to service this property. And I'll show you a little bit better of an aerial photo. So what you do see is a lot of act industrial activity going on here right now. They had actually had some fill permits with Whatcom County that transferred over to the city when we annexed. So currently there's an access easement to uh, access this property. So any potential resident development would either have to have June Road developed or they would go through industrial property just to get there. Um, additionally, with the zoning boundary here, the industrial portion would have to have, you know, when they develop additional of a, set, a setback of 25 feet from that area. So with the environmental constraint, there is some development opportunity here. And it, when combined with the other portion of property here, it allows more opportunity for um, use of land for this area here. And so finally, I would just like, as Rich, as Rick mentioned the uh, Planning Commission held a public hearing on September 1st and determined that the both proposals um, met the docking criteria. With this proposal here, uh, the Planning Commission added a condition that the applicant submit a uh, critical area study for this site as part of the rezone application. And that's actually one of the rezone criteria that's identified in our code. So. Uh, within your packet is uh, a resolution that establishes the list for your consideration. And with that, I can answer any questions you may have. Councilmember Murphy. Could you just go over what docketing means and how that works? Well, docketing is a two-step process. First, uh, the council needs to establish the list Excuse of- Excuse me, someone has a mic open. Okay, so docking is basically established the list of proposed comprehensive plan am amendments to be reviewed the next annual cycle. So basically, they submit this year, because you have 30 days to submit, and then it gets placed on the list so that the applicant is able to submit that application for review. And it's, it's a way of monitoring how, how many applications that are coming into the city and making sure that we have the resources there to evaluate within the next annual cycle. So it's basically just creating a list. To the follow up on that, state law requires us only to amend it once per year. So we consolidate it onto the docket. We open notice it for the public to submit. Um, we have the filters of those criteria to make sure it was worth the community's time to move forward on. Again, doesn't prejudge an outcome by keeping it on the docket, but does let us go to the next Zen level of environmental review, assessment, and public hearing. Councilmember Brecker. These are both getting transferred from single family, I mean, housing into, is that correct? Am I reading that? Residential? Resident so is it yes. going to change the numbers in the comprehensive plan as to the um, units available for possible construction? Well, in, for instance, for this area one, you're, you have a, a area that's just over 11,000 square feet. And, and this doesn't follow any kind of platted line, so it's not even a legal lot of record for this one quarter to be built on. And with the setbacks on here and Sunset being a designated arterial, you have some, some big hurdles to go through as, as well as with the pipeline easement that also runs through there. So really, if you look at this, it's all one parcel like that. It hasn't been short platted, so to speak 
for this proposal. Um, for proposal two here, I'm going to go to this map here. Um, the applicant, they've done some preliminary work on the critical areas that are in the area and what they have um, basically said that with the dwelling units, you know, based on density alone, it's about 60 uh, housing units. However, with all the environmental constraints that are there, they've identified they could probably only get about 15 housing units for this site. I have a small question. Um, why aren't these just rezones? Why do they need to be comp plan amendments as well? Because you're also amending the uh, comprehensive uh, land use map as well as the zoning map to change these in the neighborhood plan. Well, what would have to be the case, really is echoey, uh, what would have to be the case for there to just be a rezone and not a comp plan amendment? Because you'd be changing the zoning map every time. You're, you're either staying with the same density or you're staying within the same land use classification. Councilmember Parker. I mean, both spots seem a little bit counterintuitive to what we've talked about. We want in housing, having access, the environmental factors of being able to walk to a store. So, I mean, I don't think I have any further questions. I think. With that, I would um, hearing. Oh, hearing. yeah. My apologies. Sorry, right. I'm a little distracted tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Council members, any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we will uh, give the public an opportunity to voice their concerns or thoughts. Um, I have two names, and again, this is the public hearing just for this plan amendment. And the first one I have is Ron Jepson, and then Jeff uh, Kavni. Thank you. <laughs> and again, forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Please just do state it for the record. <clears throat> like that map or the other map? It's the other one. That one? Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. This one? This one? That one? Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. You can speak first. <laughs> Good evening, members of the council. My name is Ron Jepson. My address is 222 Grand Avenue. I'm an engineer and I'm representing the owners of this particular application tonight. Uh, I appreciate the fact that the Planning Commission gave us a unanimous vote um, to be docketed. And also, uh, we are totally amenable to submitting a critical areas uh, report uh, with the uh, rezone application. In fact, we have done wetland delineations over the entire property and just needs to be put into the city's format. This is really an anomaly in a way in that the 20 acres was divided into two separate zones which are really incompatible with each other, industrial to the west and single family to the east. There are considerable constraints, uh, both topographically and environmentally, with the 10 acres to the east. Um, there is currently, and there's a particular print in your packet that shows a an existing conservation easement that pretty much covers the entire easterly side of the 10-acre parcel. Um, it's really not as green as the uh, aerial photograph shows, but there is property that can be utilized uh, by uh, the industrial property, same ownership, to the west. Uh, it is virtually landlocked. Uh, there will be no other physical access to this 10-acre parcel other than through the industrial parcel. Um, I'm personally involved with the property to the north and to the east of this parcel. Um, that is zone residential, and we have a large project planned for that. But the property immediately to the north of this 10 acres will be dedicated as open space and mitigation for wetlands within the development portion of our property. The property to the east, immediate to the east of this 10 acres essentially is Bear Creek, and we have buffers from that 
for whatever industrial uses will happen on this 10 acres. And as Moshi said, the regional city's regional detention facility pond is due south of this particular property. So in the past, when a person's property, one single ownership has been split by two different zones, the general feeling in the past has been that something needs to be made more equitable, and that was done in the case of Costco and uh, those properties there. So, <laughs> I'm over time. Okay. Um, the access to this parcel is from Pacific Ron, Highway. I have to ask you to wrap it up, okay? Okay. Thank I'm, you. I wrapped it up there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Council. My name is uh, Jeff Quam, 1651 Kelly Road. Um, I'm the applicant for this Trickle Creek uh, zoning amendment. Uh, and I really uh, keep this short. Uh, everything that planning said is correct. It's, a, it's just a very small 11,100 square foot chunk that uh, has always been in the city. It's all one ownership and uh, just uh, common sense and, and to help for uh, site development, it would it would follow that we um, get this uh, homogeneous with the rest of the zoning. So uh, I concur with uh, planning's assessment and uh, ask that uh, you please consider uh, putting it on the docket. Thank you. Is there anyone else who hasn't had an opportunity to sign up that would like to speak on this public hearing? Going once, twice, three times. Okay, I closed the public hearing, but um, is there an opportunity for, oh, we want to vote on this tonight, so it's not like we're leaving it open for a couple. Okay, all right. I'll Thank move approval. We dock at these two items. Okay. Second. Uh, we have a motion in front of us. Any discussion? Okay, so we have a motion to docket these two items to the comp plan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 6 0 with one excused. Thank you, gentlemen. And we are going to move into our public comment period of the evening. We're going to start with public comment, and everybody knows we have three minutes. You'll hear the buzzer at 30 seconds. Um, our first, our in order is David Cunningham, and Mackey, Dick Conaboy, Chris Steele, and Jean Richardson. And if you didn't get an opportunity to sign up, you can always come up. Hi, my name is David Cunningham. I live in the Birchwood neighborhood. Um, um, I'm addressing these remarks. Uh, I'm going to send the letter in tomorrow with my remarks, but I, for some reason, thought we were talking more of the, the whole comprehensive plant, not just the docketing of those two items. So I, I'm a little premature with this, but um, I'm going to read what I wrote just so it's compatible with what I send in tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> I'm concerned about how the process for updating the comprehensive plan has gone forward, especially with a lack of transparency regarding H18. Uh, the policy, that put particular policy seems to be created by a group that did not include all the stakeholders in housing in this uh, city. Neighborhood groups being one of the groups of stakeholders that was left out, but that's not the only one. There are other people like homeless, et cetera, that were not um, included in that um, development of that parse, part of the policy. H18 appears to be intended 
to prevent and correct exclusionary housing um, issues in our community. However, it doesn't appear to have been adequately vetted or, um, as there are numerous articles available that point to different outcomes than those that are being proposed by the select group that created that policy. The issue of exclusionary housing is a concern to all of us. Um, I live in one of the most diverse neighborhoods in our community, that's Birchwood. And I believe that most of the members of our neighborhood and most of the neighborhoods that I've spoken to um, have a lot of uh, shared common interest in resolving these problems of homeless and uh, diversity and exclusionary housing or uh, not having exclusionary housing. Um, I think we'd all like to work together to solve these problems. Unfortunately, many members of the, of the neighborhood associations feel that their input and concerns have been brushed aside. While our city government is supposed to be a representative government, many of us are feeling very unrepresented, unrepresented in how the elected officials are considering the exclusionary housing issue. It's quite ironic that the process of talking about exclusionary housing has been exclusionary in itself. The issue of enforcement is an integral part, integral, integral part of the discussion as, as zoning laws and rules um, are not worth the, the paper that they're written on if they're not enforced properly, and that's one of the problems we have in the city right now. I believe that good leadership starts with good listening skills. I would like to have the needs and the concerns of the full community, not just the certain favored groups, show up in the final outcome of the comprehensive plan. A three-minute period per person is, for a public hearing is, does not constitute adequate input time for all the stakeholders left out of this process. Thank you. Thank you, David and Mackey. Yes, good evening. My name is Ann Mackey. I live in the York neighborhood, and I, too, am going to speak to the issue of H-18 and why I believe that that should be removed. I sent the council a letter dated November 1st. I didn't see it in your packet, although it is in some kind of separate addendum, so I hope you have an opportunity to read that. It is available. Um, what's really kind of interesting about H-18 is that no one really knew what it contained until October 24th, which was the date that... Um, where the public comment and, pu and public um, record and hearing had already been closed. So it was after the public hearing had been closed that we then finally saw the contents of that document, which I'd been asking for for many, many months. I'll remind you that in May I wrote a letter asking that it be removed and that it was um, still a mystery about what it contained. And finally, after your meeting on the 24th of October, I did receive from a staff member a copy of the summary recommendations of a chat of the chat action items. What's really valuable about having it uh, left in now is it is uh, a great rallying cry for neighborhood activists and advocates who are using it as an example of government that does not include uh, all stakeholders. It's become very symbolic about um, how things are done behind closed doors. There was a work group that was established and we did not know until after the 24th who the members of the work group were and they all were people engaged in uh, banking and financing of housing and nonprofit and for-profit builders. And it's unfortunate that it took this long to find out who was involved. And for people watching at home, you're probably wondering why are we obsessing about this thing called H18. Um, and that's because it really does call for an evaluation of things like condominiums in single-family neighborhoods, duplexes in single-family neighborhoods, garage apartments in single-family neighborhoods, and detached ADUs and cottages in single-family neighborhoods. And these are all specific housing forms that were not allowed in single-family neighborhoods. So this is a pretty big thing. It's a pretty big change that came at the 11 and a half hour in a comp plan process that's been over nine months. So it's disappointing, but on the other hand, it's advantageous to those of us who are making the issue um, with um, whatever board will listen that we believe that this is not an appropriate um, out in the open kind of a way to conduct business. Um, it's exciting that there are uh, new um, low-income housing projects coming in all over the city. Two student projects came in with 1,000 uh, 
rooms for them. We've got Eleanor Apartments in the York neighborhood. We're very proud of our involvement in encouraging that kind of infill. That's going to have 80 beds, and there are many more. So I think that the city is moving forward collectively for some affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. And Dick Conboy. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dick Conboy. I live in the Samish neighborhood. Uh, I second the motion on the first two speakers about H18, but I'm not going to speak to that. I want to go back to something that was uh, talked about this afternoon with respect to ADUs and the uh, inventory uh, and assessment that's supposed to take place before uh, we do anything about uh, actually uh, putting in an ADU ordinance. Uh, I think uh, it's really important to watch how we frame these issues and the vocabulary that we use. Uh, this afternoon, I heard on several occasions uh, people speak to windshield inventories or windshield assessments or surveys uh, coming from the neighborhoods. And what this does is it sets up a dynamic where it looks like people uh, who will, will drive up and down the alleys and kind of look at uh, old garages and shacks and whatnot that are on properties and then make a list of those and then turn them into uh, planning saying, well, we've got all these ADUs. And that's really not what's happening within the neighborhoods. And I, and I talk to the people who are doing this. They're taking a look closely at the structures that are on these lots. These are people who have been in the neighborhoods for 10, 20 years. They know what's going on there. And they're looking for things like uh, extra cars. They're looking for activity at night. They're looking for uh, electrical connections and things, things of that nature. They're going to the property records and seeing what was approved for that property uh, along the years. So it's just not a, a slapdash project where you drive down on a rainy night with the windshield wipers going and take a look and see what these shacks are. Uh, that's not the case. So I would like to ask you to ban this windshield inventory, windshield survey from the vocabulary, the discussion on ADUs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. Chris Steele. Hi, my name is Chris, um, Christopher Bruce Diley. Yeah, um, just following back up on, I don't want to make a habit of, as I already have, of speaking here so often. I'm trying to put an end to it. Uh, but uh, I, I did want to follow up on having spoke last meeting about the, um, on the public hearing and regarding the Bellingham Finance Director, Brian Henshaw, when, when I made a point regarding the, the public hearing was on the 2017-18 revenue projections, including an increase in the property tax levy, which I addressed specifically. And what my point was is that the, the, the numbers that he showed on the, on the screen was that um, almost double the amount of tax revenue is going for parks and recreation for greenways, which is up for a vote for a tax levy, um, as is going for affordable housing. And I thought those numbers should be reversed. You know, why is more money going for parks and rec than for affordable housing, particularly when the, the affordable housing, when the list is closed, we can't even get on it. The waiting list is closed and doing sweeps of people in homeless tents. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing crisis. It's not being addressed. And yet, when he was asked, when the finance director, Brian Henshaw, was asked by the chairperson, uh, Pinky Vargas, if he would like to respond to the point that I made, he, he responded with, with, and I looked at this on the video at the library numerous times, and it, he responded with belittlement of my point, and numerous uh, uh, council members laughed. And, you know, and I just wanted to point that out, that I found that really offensive and disrespectful, because you know, I don't have a, in, in a high education, very much education, so I don't know a lot of what I'm talking about. But when I see things like that, I think it's pretty simple that, you know, the money's not going there. And just uh, very quickly, I'll point out with uh, Noam Chomsky, uh, that's from, uh, I've read this before, I'll say it again very quickly, I'll have to read fast. Um, this is from Noam Chomsky, Understanding Power, Chapter 10, Footnote 28. Comparison of the impact of social spending on poverty rates reveals a vast difference between the U.S. and other industrialized nations. The U.S. tax and transfer system creates a 28.5% reduction in the poverty rate, 
whereas the tax and transfer systems in all other industrialized countries decreased poverty rates by between 60 and 80 percent, the only exceptions being Britain, Australia, and Canada, whose tax and transfer programs still reduce poverty rates by approximately 50 percent. Okay, um, so 30 seconds. Um, that, that to me, he, he's explaining the problem, and, and I think we need to address as to why the money is not going for affordable housing for low-income housing, why it's going for uh, parks and rec. And down in Seattle, $800 million going for the stadiums, you know, for the Seattle Seahawks and Seattle Mariners. Why is this? Why, why can't we switch that stuff around? Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Jean Richardson. Hi. Um, Jeannie Richardson, Birchwood Neighborhood. After reading the housing section of the comp plan, I noticed the insertion of policy H18, which came from some community solutions group. The list of the people in the group looked impressive. However, there were no representatives from the impacted neighborhoods, no neighborhood board reps or otherwise. It seems like this is unfair as the regular people that live in these neighborhoods are not having a say and I suggest removing this policy until there has been a fair review by the neighborhoods. I live in one of the more affordable neighborhoods in Bellingham. My concern with H18 is that it opens things up for investors to come into the older neighborhoods, buy up the affordable homes, make them into duplexes by adding detached ADUs, period. <laughs> I have been coming to the Planning Commission and City Council meetings for the past year and noticed that a great number of people have shown up to tell how they've been negatively affected by these ADUs. There seems to, be, seems to have been little enforcement and follow-up after enforcement. On the subject of infill, I've heard someone say that Millennials don't want to live in urban villages because of the cost. I really don't observe this as I've watched many house, house TV shows where young people are looking for a place to rent or own and 90% of them say they want to live where they can walk to restaurants, bars, and shops. And nowadays with the young people being able to work from home, being paid higher, higher wages from the tech companies, etc. The urban villages are good solutions to density. That's my thing. Thanks. Thank you, Jean. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak at public comment that didn't have a chance to sign up? If you could just state your name for the record. Eric Scott Birchwood. At the microphone, please. Eric Thank Scott you. Birchwood. Do we have a, a hold on? Can I get the uh, projector in? Go ahead. There you go. Okay. Go ahead, Elizabeth. So, I can change the zoom to, I think, somewhere. Okay. So H18, here we go. I believe that's the, uh, the current version of it. Uh, we got this a few days ago. My comments, obviously, it's, are... It's not there. current. Excuse me, say again? Does it change a little bit? Yeah. Okay. What about the bullet points? I think they're, the, they're about the same. Okay, well, bullet points. So same, same. So a previous uh, neighbor had referred to this as whack-a-mole. In other words, uh, one bad thing was pushed down to only reemerge as, as a different name. Now, the actors of that, I believe, are the members of that. So we have uh, construction, um, government agency dealing in construction, construction, habitat for humanity, uh, construction. Um, whether they're for-profit or non-profit. Um, Coalition Land Trust, they are a land-owning agency or uh, uh, organization. They own the land. I don't believe they actually, uh, I believe you lease the land from them. I don't know about these guys. Um, construction, construction, or, or, sorry, uh, I'm not sure about that one. Construction, uh, Opportunity Council, I looked them up. They had $22 million of revenue last, or 2013, I think. 
I, that's hard to believe. I'm not, I, I've got to look into who they are a little more, but that's a lot of money. It's a very lucrative nonprofit. Um, realtors, obviously, you know, for-profit, uh, bank, bank. So a lot of for-profit, almost nothing from the neighborhoods, no neighborhood organization. Back to the H18. Bullet points, uh, detached ADU, so major up zone. Uh, impact fee reduction, so shift the burden. Somebody's got to pay for that. Uh, parking redu reduced, no cars, really? That has not been the case in the neighborhoods that have been affected by these ADUs. And the last one, yikes, other code changes and incentives to allow and encourage well-designed, and I say, who's standard? And I, you, you can almost bet it will not be the neighboring homes. It'll be someone else's standard. And a very vague one line put in at the end says other code. I think I submitted some comments saying, uh, you know, if a surgeon, a surgeon were to put you under before uh, anesthesia and tell you you'll have some other limbs and organs removed, you know, what would you think of that? That's about what we're saying here in development. And last, I got 16 seconds. I'm going to be in trouble. There we go. So we're using the water bill now to uh, promote this uh, in bill. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Is there anybody else who wish to speak at public comment this evening? Okay. Going once, twice. Okay, I'm going to close the public comment period of the evening and we're going to move on to the review of our committee meetings from this afternoon. Our first meeting was Public Works, Public Safety and Jean Knudsen is chairing for Terry Borneman. Thank you, Pinky. We had four items today. The first item was the Department of Ecology Lift Station SRF loan application. Staff provided an update on two applications for sanitary sewer lift station design and construction loans and fulfillment of the Department of Ecology's review process. Uh, there's no fiscal impact at this time. The debt service on a $1.7 million loan in 2017 and $4.4 million, $4 million loan in 2018. If we do approve the loans, it'll be brought back to council at a later date. The next item was an ordinance to the City of Bellingham, Washington amending the various section of the Bellingham Municipal Code in order to adopt reference in order to adopt by reference several com criminal codes of the revised Code of Washington. In order to prosecute state laws in municipal court, the city must first adopt the Pacific State Code provisions in reference by the city's municipal code. These specific provisions relate to the closing intimate images, surrender of weapons, and failure to rest, register as a sex offender or kidnapping offender. Uh, this afternoon, the committee recommended approval and I so move. Second. Any discussion? No? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with one excuse. The third item was authorized first amendment to agreement for the inmate housing with Southern Correctional Entity called SCORE. City staff have identified and implemented a variety of tools for managing Bellingham's inmate population in response to requests by Whatcom County. The contract for inmate housing with SCORE provides another tool to address overcrowding in the main jail. This amendment extends the contract term through December of 31st, 2020 and increases the 2017 bed rate to $162.65. Uh, the committee recommends approval and I shall move. Second. Any discussion? Councilmember Lewis. So I wasn't here this morning and I'm not on the committee, but it just struck me how much more expensive the score option is than the Yakima option. So I was wondering if that was discussed and yeah. clearly we want to prioritize the cheaper option. Sure. No, this is, this is even worse yeah, than Whatcom no. County's rate. Right? Go ahead, Peter. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, Peter Rafato, Legal Department. So um, if you remember, we contracted with SCORE as a last resort and it'll continue to be a last resort. Um, we used it, I think, twice uh, during a time when there were booking restrictions imposed and those were for um, some uh, defendants who were actually booked directly by Bellingham Police Department so that's, it's at least a facility that's on the west side of the mountains. Um, we anticipate using Yakima County and not SCORE. Um, but 
given um, what we've seen and the situation with the Whatcom County Jail and sort of the ever-changing landscape and the restrictions imposed, we, we feel we want to continue to have this tool as an option. Okay, we have a motion in front of us, and all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. The last item was the First Amendment to the Inmate Housing Agreement with Yakima County Department of Corrections. Bellingham is currently limited to booking and short term holding at the Whatcom County Main Jail as directed by the Whatcom County Sheriff. Pre trial as well as post conviction inmates are transferred out of the main jail within days after booking. The, Whatcom, the Yakima County Jail provides transportation and full inmate housing services at per diem rates and are increasing by 4.5% 4, 4, 4 in 2017. There continues to be a no cost for transportation or booking. The per diem rate remains significantly lower than the rate charged by Whatcom County Jail. The agreement with Yakima County for its services is an unneeded basis. The amendment extends the term of this agreement through, 23rd, 20, through December 31st, 2017 and sets forth the increased rates for 2017. That is $57.20 per day. That is a much better deal, plus free transportation and free booking. The uh, committee recommends approval and I so move. Second. Any discussion? Okay, we have a motion in front of us to authorize the First Amendment to Inmate Housing Agreement with Yakima County Department of Corrections. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0 with one excuse. And a committee. And then we are going to move on to finance and personnel, and Roxanne Murphy is the chair. Thank you, Madam President. We had why it's ringing. Okay, we had two agenda items. <laughs> two agenda items that are highly related to one another. The first is an ordinance amending the 2015-2016 adopted budget, appropriating additional expenditure to account for a change in accounting practice. Uh, this was recommended by the committee, and I so move. Any discussion? Okay, we have a motion in front of us amending the 2015-2016 adopted budget, appropriating additional funds to the account for change in accounting practice. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with one excused. So what we just did will make a little more sense with this next initiative. This is an ordinance amending the 2015-2016 Medic One budget for vehicle purchase, facility repair, and salaries. Staff was seeking approval of an ordinance amending the 2015-2016 Medic, Medic One budget to allow for purchase of a medic unit and ambulance, completion of unanticipated facility repairs, and retroactive salary and benefits paid to paramedics. This was approved by the committee, and I so move. Second. Any discussion? Okay, we have a motion and second in front of us uh, for the ordinance amending the 2015-16 Medic One budget for vehicle purchase, facilities, repair, and salaries. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with one excuse. End of committee. Okay, thank you, Roxanne. All right, so the next was Committee of the Whole. The first item we had in front of us was a resolution setting the 2017 uh, City Council meeting calendar and committee recommended approval. With that, I so move. Second. Any discussion? Okay. We have a motion in front of us to approve the 2017 City Council meeting calendar. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. The one excused. And next item was a resolution by the City of Bellingham making a declaration of substantial need for the purpose of setting the limit factor for the 2017 property tax levy and the and committee did recommend approval and i so move second any discussion okay so a motion in front of us for the resolution to approve the resolution for the city Co city council of bellingham making a declaration of substantial need for the purpose of setting the limit factor of the 2017 property tax levy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. With one excused. The next item was the 2017 property tax ordinance and committee did recommend approval and I so move. Any discussion? 
Okay. Motion is for the 2017 property tax ordinance. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. And then we had our uh, fourth item was the Committee of the Whole Work Session on the Draft 2016 Bellingham Comprehensive Plan. And uh, committee did recommend approval. And with that, I so move. Any Second. discussion? You might want to put that Michael's language on the screen so people can see what we did, if anybody has it, I don't. Rick, do you have it by you chance? Have, yeah. Way to call you on, yeah. <laughs> put you on spot. No, Actually, that, he, it's probably in our book. No, that was the old one there. It's on page 107 or page one of exhibit B. Okay, we'll do it. Get extra pay today, don't I? AV geek. Yeah, the only reason I'm bringing it up, it doesn't say implementing, it now says evaluating. So that was the language that Michael brought forward forward last week. So. Councilmember Lillequist. Um, first, I have a question from staff. Um, I've assumed all along that H18 was in the original published draft as taken forward to the Planning Commission several months ago. I just want to confirm that H18 really has been in published form for several months. Clearly it wasn't noticed by people until quite recently, but is it true that it has been in the draft all along? I think it was in my draft when, as soon as I received it. Well, first of all, it was first presented to the council in 2014. So it came when the, when the housing group was, you know, was completed. But I think it says, they are January. Yes, this is the draft that was presented in January 21st of this year. It was known as policy H15 at the time. It says continue implementing the recommendations of the countywide housing affordability task force chat, including, and it lists all the bullets. Councilmember Lillequist. So I guess I kind of want to make a few points. I, I know that before I was in the council, I certainly never would have paid attention to age 15, which then becomes age 18. Um, but this wasn't stuck in at the last minute. I also want to make it clear that um, it was very important to me that we strike the word implementing, because as everyone acknowledges, it really has not been discussed. We heard some comments tonight which basically said, this opens the doors to all these things. Well, no, it no longer does. It opens the door to only to a discussion. There is no ordinance changes that this requires or authorizes. It changes none of our de de development rules. Um, and I, then I want to go to an even a larger question. About four years ago, I started really complaining about the fact that we did a poor job of communicating some things. And about three years ago, I initiated a change, citywide change to our communications policy. And kind of the, the heart of that is that we as a city need to get out in front with information to our public, not to propagandize to them, but to provide information ahead of time so we don't have to explain after the fact. Unfortunately, I think this is what what happened in this case. We didn't notice. We didn't get out front. There's a great deal of misunderstanding. I'm not trying to defend H18. I think it was actually a mistake, and I think we've fixed a lot of that mistake. But I think a lot of our problem has to do with our inability to foresee when there's going to be misunderstanding, that we've laid some sort of um, you know, landmine is too strong a word, but we, we've, we've created a little controversy just... which is kind of waiting to happen, and we didn't see it. And I'd wish we could do a better job of 
seeing these things before they happen, and when they start to happen, do a better job of re responding very proactively, not defensively, but proactively with education and information. For example, the simple fact that this thing has been around in written form in a draft since January of this year, I think, changes the whole tone about who put this in and when. The fact that it came from a group, uh, who are these people? Well, half of those people are nonprofits that spend their days, day and night, earning less than the standard wage trying to fight for people with low income to provide them with housing. You may not like their suggestions, but they're good people, and those are good organizations. So I think that if we had more information on that, it would go a long way. I actually agree with the criticism. I think that group maybe should have had neighborhood representatives. That was maybe a mistake that was done a couple years ago. We could admit our mistakes, but I think we make our mistakes worse when we don't recognize it and communicate to our public. And I'm talking to you because this is our job, right? We're the ones who don't always do a good job of providing the explanations in the way that maybe we should. And, and you know, frankly, I mean, I put stuff on an email on my Facebook page under city council but I'm not the greatest, you know, um, you know, speaking trumpet. People don't listen to me, you know, they listen to me in the dozens, not the thousands or the hundreds. Um, so it's just a long discussion. I really regret the fact there's been controversy over H18. I think as changed, it makes it what it should be, just the basis for a discussion. Um, Hopefully people will agree and hopefully people will understand that we don't always do the perfect job of communicating, but I, I, I think we do a pretty good job of, in the end, of getting it right. I think one of the things, Michael, having gone through a couple of total rewrites is this was not a total rewrite, and I think maybe we should have, because when it goes out to the public, people are going to read every single page, they're going to read every single line, and that's something that maybe we should have thought about before. As, Broadcasting is not a total rewrite, just an update. But I think that's where some of the, because people are going to read, you know, when something's put out there, they're going to read the whole thing. But uh, again, like I said this afternoon, it wouldn't have been my first choice to leave that in there at all, but I can't vote against the whole plan. But I think putting the word evaluating means that's exactly what we're going to do. And the citizens are going to keep our feet to the fire when they watch us deliberate on these topics. And that's the way it should be. Councilmember Parker. Well, I'll talk about this just for a second and, and then we'll move on to the, the greater of what happened in the comprehensive plan. But it's it's an example of the public process. I mean, this passed the planning commission. It had inappropriate language in it. It passed through staff. Something had gotten changed, I assume, as it was getting built and that word implementing didn't get changed with it. And then the community came forward and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then, and then we changed the language to, to fit it more. So I, I think it's a good example of even though um, it's kind of impressive that none of us caught it and a whole set of another group didn't catch it and our staff didn't catch it, but our community did. So it, it gives me more um, uh, confidence in, in the process and the people that are watching it and participating. Uh, I, I don't want it to get lost. Uh, we did have a full discussion this afternoon and I think if you're interested in hearing that, you can go back. We all need to <laughs> re-speak that. But, some really amazing things that went into the comprehensive plan and it's an easy place to find it if you go to the comprehensive plan comment tracker you can actually read and then hear the re see the rebuttal of the planning department of what people suggested what the council suggested and what the planning department suggested and what ended up happening and i, I think you'll see some really phenomenal uh, implementations that are focusing our community on thinking about health and wellness and integration and thoughtfulness and equity um, being sustainable, I mean, Michael, we did a lot on trying to figure out what does that word mean, doing a lot better of looking into words and like what do we mean when we say these words. That's really important as um, a constituent suggested today. So again, thank you to staff. <laughs> it was a, a long process and as a council member, it was like getting thrown into the wolves on my first year of um, being on council doing a comprehensive plan. But. I, I kind of feel like it's probably the way to go because I learned so much and now I have the next three years of like knowing this the comprehensive plan really, really well. So and also thank you to council. So it got tense and things get difficult, but you know, change change can't happen without some conflict. Things have to rub a little bit for us to get where we need to be. So There was obviously some conflict around H18 and people's concerns and those, and we absolutely hear them. 
Um, but overall, the comprehensive plan in itself, in its entirety, I think is a really fantastic body of work. There was extraordinary work done by the staff and all the effort that all the council put in. I think it's so much more inclusionary and equitable all the way across the board. And I'm very proud of what we came out of here. And I am very grateful for the staff and for everyone who came before us to um, provide input and make this a really strong document. So one issue I realize is contentious, but overall, this entire plan is a really great body of work. And I want to thank everyone who put all their effort into it. So thank you very much for that. Councilmember Murphy. No, I'm just excited if we vote for it to work on the implementation of all these great ideas and all the ways that we can improve our community because this council is dedicated to helping out our neighborhoods, to supporting our business community, to working with our nonprofits, to protecting our environment. So many values are in this comprehensive plan and it's stuff that I look forward to partnering with the community on. So we have a motion and second, and this is to approve the um, comprehensive plan update. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with one excused. Yeah, well. Okay, the next item we had was a work session of our 2017-2018 budget. We conducted this in the mayor's boardroom. And we had a review from the executive team, planning and community development, fire department, police department, and municipal court. Um, and we will continue the 2017 biennial work session next November 17th. So we are putting pushing November that through. 14th. November 14th. <laughs> we don't have to come here on the no. <laughs> I won't be here on the 17th. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and we hope to have all presentations completed by the November 14th and have something in front of us on December 5th. Uh, okay, so that, and then from there, that was the end of our committee and we will go to, uh, we've got two meeting, uh, sorry, two meeting minutes to approve. The first one is for October 17th special meeting. Move approval. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And the next set of meetings were for our um, council meeting of October 24th. Move approval. Same. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Okay, older new business. Well, we, I know this we all afternoon. said something this afternoon, so I don't know if there was anybody who wanted to repeat anything from this afternoon or Councilmember Murphy. Don't forget to vote. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tomorrow's the election? I didn't know that. Huh? Uh, well, I, I guess I can just give one update. Um, uh, I was just talking about the update of the Georgetown University Energy Prize. We've got two months left before our two-year competition is over. Um, I have been uh, asked to go speak at the National Cities Conference next week in Pittsburgh to talk about what the, um, the City of Bellingham has done around community collaboration and um, how we can, I'm doing a session on uh, city solutions so i'm very proud of our city and the work that we've done and i'm very excited to have that opportunity councilmember murphy well i just wanted to thank the fire department for having us at their firefighter recognition event i attended so did councilmember barker and councilmember lilliquist and it's always a really nice event to attend. If any of our community members can make it next year, I hope you'll come. Uh, they honor the fire department folks that are retiring, folks that have showed exemplary service, and also community partners that have helped out the fire department. So it's just a good time to celebrate that hard work, and I appreciated being at the event. Anything else for older new business? Um, and I have a report out of our executive session. Okay, in one of the 30 papers I was passed. Let's see. Do, do, do. Aha, here we go. 
Executive session report out for Monday, November 7th. Property, potential property acquisition. Staff provided information on a potential property acquisition. The action to entertain a motion to authorize a purchase of 58 acres in the Lake Wacom watershed from Marlin Enterprises for $100,000 with an anticipated closing date of November 21st, 2016. So move. Second. Any discussion? Okay, we have a motion in front of us to um, approve the potential property acquisition. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with one excused. The next was a potential litigation. Staff provided information on a potential litigation matter. There was an action. Entertain a motion to authorize the city's attorney office to file a motion to intervene in Whatcom County's Association of Realtors versus Whatcom County Western Washington Growth Management Hearings Board case number 16-2-007. Move approval. Second. Second. Discussion? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And the third item in executive session was potential property acquisition. Staff provided information on a potential property acquisition uh, for information and discussion only, and no action was taken. And with that, we're going to go to the mayor's report. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I appreciate you um, acknowledging the good work that the that the commission the commission that the planning department and the commission did on bringing forward the comprehensive plan there was a lot of hard work that went into it there were awful lot of comments uh, that I feel very happy were considered by the council um, and I am glad that now we can do what Roxanne said and start implementing things that are in there. It's um, pretty exciting because I haven't been through one of these before. <laughs> um, secondly, we gave you a form to fill out if you were interested in uh, suggesting any changes to the budget. And so if we're planning on discussing those on the, fort, uh, the 14th of November, uh, so if you could fill those out, that'd be great. Um, I also have uh, appointments, one, uh, one for, two for information only. Mayor's appointment of Sharon Rutherford and Mary Welch to the Bellingham Whatcom County Commission Against Domestic Violence. And then I need your approval on reappointing Skylar Hinckley to the Green Waste Advisory Committee. Move approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion to reappoint Skylar Hinckley to the Greenways. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. That's all, oh. Mayor Kelly? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I do have something else to say, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> uh, consent to Move approval. approval. Second. You <laughs> kind of got it out. Yeah. All right. Uh, any discussion? No. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6-0 with one excused. Final consideration of ordinances. Agenda Bill 20196. An ordinance relating to the vacation <clears throat> of an unnamed east-west right-of-way generally located north of West Bakerview Road between Arctic Avenue and Pacific Highway, all within the city of Bellingham. Move third and final. Second. Dan Hamill. Aye. Jean Knudsen. Aye. Michael Lelliquist. Aye. Roxanne Murphy. Aye. Pinky Vargas. Aye. April Barker. Aye. And Terry Borneman is excused. Ordinance passes 6-0. Okay, our next meeting is November 14th. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us. We are adjourned.